Thank you, Eleonora, and thank you, Franz. Um, let us now turn to the opening lecture of our conference, which also kicks off the weekly research colloquium on medieval and early modern history. I am pleased to welcome Richard Herzog, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at the History Department of the Philips Universität Marburg and at the DFG Collaborative Research Center Transregio. And these terms are also horrible. Dynamics of security, types of securitization from a historical perspective. His main work deals with Latin America, decolonial studies and intellectual history with a research focus on colonial history from a transnational perspective. That sounds great. Uh, and in his doctoral thesis completed at Gießen University, Richard studied Nawa scholars at uh, or of central colonial Mexico and has conducted archival research in Mexico and Spain. He will talk about Merits in Motion, the Tlaxcalan campaigns for privileges and influence in colonial Mexico. Richard, you have the floor. Yes, um, so thank you so much uh, for the kind uh, introduction and uh, and uh, yeah for introduction to professor Rüter and also uh, thanks a lot for the invitation yeah to our three organizers actually with professors uh, Allinghaus and uh, Roland and also yeah professor Allinghaus who uh, was very kind to introduce me already to some of the concepts of today's conference uh, tomorrow's conference so um for today uh, just maybe just a quick uh, organizational question the windows they will stay open or is it you can also close them if i was just them. wondering about it but <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay good thanks but i mean as as the group <laughs> prefers but uh, i just thought it might get a bit cold <laughs> over time <laughs> great so um yeah i also wanted to welcome you now to Today's talk uh, from my side, which yeah, I'm really glad to <laughs> to start off uh, our this really um, fascinating conference. And as you can see already, as you heard now, my focus for today will be on uh, Tlaxcala and a specific state in central Mexico. Yeah, it still still exists. It's still a state uh, today, and for me, the focus will be more coming a bit from the pre-Hispanic times into the into the 16th century. So Tlaxcala, for me, it's it's uh, quite this interesting case I want to focus on. And one focus for me is really on Tlaxcala, this kind of larger narrative of the state that was a special ally of the Spaniards. Yeah, the Spaniards arrived, uh, came in the early 16th century. This wars of conquest and still until today, Tlaxcala, at least in Mexico, but I think also outside Mexico is, yeah, is very well known. Um, they are, they had uh, uh, special status. Yeah. They were known as this allies, uh, the special uh, religious, uh, religiosity as well. And so for me, I'm, I wanted to ask you about this and how this kind of special status came to be. Uh, I'm looking here at some geopolitical strategies of uh, at Tlaxcala and also at, uh, at narratives yeah, that were being constructed in the mm -hmm. colonial era by uh, by these elites yeah, from from Tlaxcala. This is also then connected. You can see it a bit in my title to some transatlantic exchange here. Yeah, also. The, this uh, ties in a bit with the role of uh, Native American people in the connection to to Europe, yeah, transatlantic mobility. Um, okay. Before I um, I come now to the main focus here on Tlaxcala, I thought it would be be helpful maybe if I start off more with a bit of a 
general look at Nahua society, Nahua history um, in, in central Mexico, which hopefully ties in with some of our themes um, connected to uh, also to native history writing. So what you what I just mentioned already, I, I thought yeah, I'll, I'll add maybe on some of those terms a bit, uh, a bit of definition. Um, so I'm talking about Nawa, yeah, which would mean also the so the, the term for the Nahuatl-speaking people, yeah, still today it's the largest uh, indigenous uh, language in in Mexico. Yeah, still very very much uh, um, act, an active language. Yeah, I think over a million or more mm -hmm. more speakers today. Um, yeah, so very important. And also, it was even before the arrival of the Europeans sort of a, a lingua franca yeah, between various other languages, language groups. And uh, now what then yeah, remained very important or became maybe even more important in the, in the colonial times. So um, when I talk about Nawa now and as a kind of an overall term, another term maybe of interest here you will hear more about would be the Mexica. This was the, the dominant force, yeah, dominant group and uh, before the arrival of the Europeans, uh, popularly known maybe as the, the Aztecs. Yeah, you, <laughs> you probably heard more this, about this one, um, which, which is a bit anachronistic here, yeah, so I will stick with, uh, with Mexica. And they had their capital city in Tenochtitlan yeah, on, on this larger lake, Texcoco. Um, okay, and so just to, to kind of uh, give you a bit this this terminology. And so the the Mexica, I should also mention here then, this dominant force was kind of this larger, um, maybe we can say that was, it was the state, yeah, they had the <coughs> capital, but uh, kind of a larger maybe federation, we could say, or yeah, they had, they, they were kind of the dominant power, but they had different allies as well in the Valley of Mexico. So yeah, so surrounding this this larger lake, uh, Texcoco, and they also had uh, tributary states here yeah, that they had conquered before, um, and also, and this is now for my topic, um, the this larger kind of uh, within this larger structure, and also without of it, there were actually still enemy states here, yeah, very um, powerful ones as well. And uh, one of them is, is Tlaxcala. Yeah, so Tlaxcala was actually was not conquered by the Mexica. There were still some skirmishes going on before the just before the, the Europeans um, uh, invaded. So this was uh, was actually quite important there yeah, for Tlaxcalteca yeah, to say, okay, we as a people we've never been conquered by yeah, neither by the Mexica nor really by by the Spanish. Um, and this would also be really kind of a basis of this this larger narratives about uh, special special um, status. So from here, I think I will look a bit more into the political structure of um, of uh, of Nawa society. And um, I've been talking a bit now about states. Yeah, I mentioned some <laughs> various terms here. But um, for for the Nawa, this uh, this this larger concept of an alt, called Altepet, so it would be like a, maybe as a state. Sometimes it's compared to European city states of antiquity, more or less. <laughs> but uh, it could mean a city, the surrounding area as well, or even a, quite a larger region. And this was really central yeah, to kind of this identifications of, of various. Of the various peoples. Then the Altepet, and uh, here we have also then kind of this larger ruler class, maybe, yeah, that's called the, the Tlatokis. So they had really important powers, ritual, military, political powers um, with various dynasties that intermarried between, between these Altepet. And below this, then I should mention also this kind of a What's been called like a no, maybe noble noble class here. Yeah. Of course, we're coming now to the mother European terminology. Um, but it, it, I think there's uh, 
there are quite some similarities. Um, and also we have, uh, of course, religious uh, leaders. And the main group then would be kind of the, the commoners, yeah, lower, lower class, maybe we could, we could say. And so I mentioned the, this altipet and here the, the rulers as well. And this was really central yeah, to kind of this uh, local identification of, of the various Nawa groups. Um, it's sometimes there's a, a scholarship that talks about like micro patriotism, yeah, these these ideas. But it's we yeah, are saying that this was really essential, and it also in some ways remained really essential to to these different different groups here yeah, into the colonial times. Uh, even with colonial policies, sometimes this local identification could even become more important over time. And um, also, I should just mention here, maybe for me the, in the talk now, my focus will be quite a bit more on this kind of noble or uh, noble uh, elites yeah, for, for colonial times. It's also to do really with uh, that we have just much more information from these elite groups. And also, this would be more, most, mostly the, the people who wrote also the, this, uh, this well-known uh, chronicles or well-known um, works. So, so this was a bit more on politics, political structure, and I should also from here go a bit into, I think, uh, some uh, points on cosmo cosmology, which um, I would say it's, uh, yeah, it's quite, quite difficult. We can't really, uh, I would say, um, distinguish just uh, make the strict distinct distinction between political entities, beliefs, and, uh, for example, and the land, the nature. Um, this is yeah, often argued here yeah, for various uh, native populations in, in the Americas, yeah, that um, yeah, the, these interconnections. And uh, to give you maybe one example about it, we have, uh, uh, it's sometimes called the the cellular, cellular principle, which is to say kind of a division of into sometimes four parts, six or, or more parts, a very uh, kind of a mathematical <laughs> division often tied to the four uh, cardinal directions as well, yeah, to, to the nature, to the, to the seasons. Um, and this ties also in with, uh, with the cities, yeah, the, the layout of cities could often be in in four parts. Um, so, and uh, one kind of a famous example maybe here, it would be of uh, Tenochtitlan, yeah, the, the, the Mexica capital, um, where you have kind of at the center of this larger capital, you have the, the, the main temple, was, was called then the Templo Mayor later, but uh, kind of the spiritual center of, of the city, of the society. And inside uh, would have been yeah, the, the the high priest or uh, spiritual leader. Um, and outside of it would be the four parts uh, of the city. So kind of the city itself being a bit of a, like a microcosm yeah, of, the, of the cosmos um, mm -hmm. with, the, with the temple at the center. Okay, um, so, <laughs> um, so I've, um, with regarding to, Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, regarding these these topics, um, so I mentioned now cosmology, um, migration stories. Also, they're really really essential, tying, for example, uh, the states, uh, the alphabet to the land. Yeah, there's actually for these various many different uh, Nawa groups. They always highlighted like, their own migration from the north to the to the central central Mexico. Um, so the north, what would be now today, southern states of, of the U.S. Um, and uh, the, there would have uh, these migrations did take place, but it's mm -hmm. very much yeah, tied to kind of to this larger mythical stories that each group had. Um, and they would have some rituals when they arrived as well yeah, to make a connection between the the Altebed and the and the land.
Okay, so from here I will wanted to bring you also a, a, a nice uh, quote, which is about about the sea, and it's by a, actually by now a scholar, an anonymous scholar from the mid 16th century, about talking about the sea, which. So it's it's quite an early early poem, yeah. That one of we, we one of the earlier texts yeah, that that we have, and here he says, "It is great. It terrifies. It frightens one. It is that which is irresistible, a great marvel, foaming, glistening with waves, bitter, very bitter, most bitter, very salty. It has man-eating animals, life." It is that which surges, it stirs, it stretches, ill smelling, restless. So I wanted to bring this here also to give you a bit of an idea here maybe of, of our poetry, also this centrality of the sea, which uh, I will come, to, come back to a bit later. Yeah, it still impa remained important for, for the Nawas who travel, would travel on to Europe across the Atlantic, um, and also kind of what I mentioned before, yeah, the connections to to land, to nature, that are that are just really essential. Um, there's also this term is for the the land uh, known for the Nawa of Anawak, so would be kind of one possible translation: the land between between water, close to water. So uh, from this poem now, uh, I'm already kind of a bit in history writing now, and I think I will uh, just uh, give you a bit of an insight here into into this topic uh, regarding regarding the Nawa because it's really important for the for the Tlaxcalan case. So so um, history writing that really important. Um, Political functions, yeah, for the, the rulers of each, the Tlatoka of each, uh, Altepet of each state, yeah, who would uh, kind of even commission maybe uh, historical works uh, about this specific place. Um, they could also then have spiritual functions, very important ones, yeah, the calendar, for example, their calendrical works and writings as well. And so for for the pre Hispanic era, yeah, also it's Writing is maybe not not exactly the the best word here because uh, we we know that there was certainly very important oral tradition. Yeah, I, I just uh, mentioned here this poem songs as well, uh, but also what were later called these codices. Yeah, of images, uh, maps as well with glyphs which would could represent places and and people and many other uh, things. And also we have what's later been called also annals, annals writing about uh, different what happened in specific years, yeah, in one one place. And this could then could be connected together, for example, in performances by kind of uh, probably uh, spiritual uh, yeah, priests, maybe or yeah, uh, ritual religious uh, people. Um, reciting poems and codices and so on. And this is also often, for example, mentioned by colonial uh, Nawa scholars. Yeah, they say that this, uh, they had contact with the, with their, their elders yeah, of, of their own group and these elders, yeah, they had uh, very, very important sources for them. Um, during coming more again to, uh, from here towards the colonial era uh, regarding uh, history, history writing. Um, I would say that uh, the the author's role then, yeah, in in some ways, uh, cha changed a lot, yeah, or the even the idea <laughs> to have uh, an indi individual author, um, which is a bit maybe more from the European concept at <laughs> at that time already, um, uh, compared to, for example, to the to the Nawa, um, and also then really the importance of the alphabetic script coming in the books, yeah, the book as kind of this main uh, keeper of, of wisdom. Um, so that we have really quite uh, chain, massive changes here from this earlier modes of telling history uh, through performance 
and uh, and so on. Um, we also then have with the colonial era we have new forms of history telling history that are coming in. Yeah, which uh, would be called chronicles, uh, chronicles de Indias, for example. Um, this is often tied also to the religious orders here yeah, who introduced um, alphabetic writing, Spanish, Latin, and so on, uh, European languages, which uh, with the idea then to kind of to further Christianization, um, also really with the idea to uh, to kind of teach, teach these uh, languages and learn more about native customs in order to, to eradicate them more uh, successfully. Um, but also at the same time, then we ha do have traditional forms that do very much that persist. Yeah, like this, this codices, these uh, kind of maps, and um, we will hear much more about this also tomorrow and to, uh, some talks. So I, <laughs> I won't go more into detail here. Um, but for sure, we have these centuries-old traditions that do continue that are stay uh, very relevant. And um, for for my uh, case now, um, which is um, <laughs> uh, which is about uh, Tlaxcala and Tlaxcala again regarding history writing is really uh, very important, a very interesting case for for this region, also for the again for the colonial times as well. Um, so we do have, for example, an important center of uh, native history writing around um, Mexico City, yeah, which is, was built on, on Tenochtitlan, uh, this, this former capital. Um, but there, maybe towards the mid, later, towards the 17th century, the, there's uh, less uh, of these larger chronicles or annals that are being written, which maybe has to do with the, with the uh, decline in political power of of the traditional of the native elites, um, and and so this is quite different than with with Tlaxcala. Yeah, this is maybe also to to situate a, a bit here. Today's uh, state of Tlaxcala is yes, maybe starts about a hundred kilometers or so from to the west from from Mexico City, and uh, so at that time already also yeah, it's it's not exactly in a in the center. Um, and so here it was still possible yeah, during the whole colonial era to have really um, uh, traditions of history writing that would continue, that would stay uh, influential. At the same time, though, we, I should also stress here and really for, uh, always to keep in mind here, yeah, we, we're talking here about this uh, pre-Hispanic uh, history culture yeah, that we actually, for the now, we don't have any um, pre-Hispanic sources yeah, that, that have uh, come down to us. Unfortunately, uh, we have early colonial ones that are very important. Um, we do have, I think, a, a few yeah, that have come from other regions that have uh, survived uh, for the Maya, for example. Um, but for the Nahua, yeah, unfortunately, they were, for example, destroyed or burned by the Spanish or they were lost through time. Um, so we're always here dealing with this Kind of this reconstructions, yeah, this later colonial uh, writings, always also tied then to to specific interests. Um, yeah, for example, chronicles that could be commissioned by Spanish uh, administration, by Spanish uh, religious people, with 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 their own interests in mind. Okay, so um, from here I'm. Now, <laughs> I tried to give you a bit of uh, a very brief <laughs> overview and coming now more towards uh, Tlaxcala, my, my case study. Um, and uh, since we're in Germany today, I'm <laughs> going to bring you, this is not a, not a colonial era painting. As you can see, this is from the uh, German painter, Johann uh, Moritz Gugendas, who made this really uh, uh, really nice uh, paintings, uh, traveled a lot throughout Latin America. And here this is from the early 19th century from the uh, view from the Pico de Orizaba, say, which is really, I think, the highest mountain in, in Mexico, a very high mountain to give you 
uh, with this perspective here towards uh, clash color yeah, towards this uh, part of this one view uh, from this region and yeah again the, the importance of nature that we see through this lens and um, I mentioned nature now, but also I should say with, with Lashkalaya, there are different ideas, uh, kind of hypotheses of uh, where the name could come from. And one is that it could mean the place of the tortillas. Yeah, the <laughs> really quite, quite a, one that I like. Um, <laughs> and it, it, it also maybe points to yeah, this, this importance of, of corn, maize, yeah, which is, is really one of the central foodstuffs in, in Mexico and in many parts of the Americas until today. Um, okay, um, so with Tlaxcala now, so I'm, I, I already talked a bit now about, about these forms of political organization. Um, with Tlaxcala, it's, uh, it also had this structure into of uh, four parts, yeah, who actually in Prehispanic times, apparently, they had really their own structures, each part with their own ruler, their own Tlatoani, um, and it's sometimes called a complex altipet, yeah, this uh, formation where, where they kind of they formed this sort of federation as well. Um, and this, again, yeah, to, to, stre to stress here some, um, some continuities, this also, these four parts did remain also into the colonial era, um, but they did not have, uh, of course, these four rulers anymore. Um, and also we do have uh, then a formation of a kind of a colonial era city uh, towards the center of, of the region, um, which is kind of was built on the, on these Spanish models, yeah, the, for the Spaniards, this was really, really important to have a European style city with the European city center um, in order also to gain specific rights. So this was also kind of a strategic moment. Um, the the um, Klaus Kalteka, so they, I mentioned this uh, just at the beginning as well, they uh, actually did have uh, play a really important role in this um, conquest, uh, these conquest wars, yeah, or what's, uh, what's now being called the wars between Mexica and, and the Spaniards, actually, yeah. And, uh, at, uh, although this is still a bit misleading, yeah, because the Spanish were, played one part, but they did have many, actually, many various uh, native allies. Um, the Tlaxcalteca were very important, but uh, I would say even maybe until today, they are sometimes considered as not the only one, but really the, very much the, the most important one. Um, and from the Tlaxcalteca point of view, yeah, this is really often highlighted, yeah, that uh, they are maybe even the only allies that uh, played played the, this part in the, in the fall of Tenochtitlan and of the Mexica. Um, there's also then kind of a construction here of a narrative taking place yeah, where from this perspective this is also constructed as a kind of a uh, the alliance that took place between Spaniards and Lux Calteca is described as very peaceful yeah it's a very swift alliance they just meet and uh, they come over and they uh, they convert uh, to Christianity very quickly of course um, which uh, yeah also we find this uh, actually with with various other and now our groups also this, this narrative. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned before, actually there were various military um, conflicts before. Um, although, of course, then the Clash Calteca, they did have quite some good strategic reasons also to side with the Europeans. Yeah, as I said, they, they were, had been really enemies with the Mexica, against the Mexica. And so there, there could have been this idea, yeah, to, actually to gain more influence um, by defeating or helping defeat the, the Mexica. Although, again, yeah, with, this, with these uh, narratives, we do uh, have a bit the issue then that other important groups, for example, the Akoloa also did play a role, the people of uh, Huejo Cinco, different other places were being sidelined 
uh, also in the narratives of the Spanish uh, authors. Okay, um, so from here, this was a bit my my perspective, uh, very general now, more on Dutch color, and from here I will move over towards this uh, more transatlantic um, perspective. So we're coming now more towards the mid to later 16th century. And um, for, again, I think for the background now, it's quite important there yeah, that to talk a bit about also the, maybe the administration that uh, was uh, was actually central for the for the Clash Calteca and for their for their own uh, strategies, um, because so we we do have um, yeah, various layers of <laughs> of administration in, in Spanish America. I won't go too much into detail now, um, but I do want to mention that uh, for example with Clash Calla we have. Uh, kind of a city council, maybe it could be called, yeah, the, the Cabildo de Indios, which is really an important institution at the local level yeah, and in, in many, many regions of uh, also of, of Spanish America. Um, and uh, so it's it's interesting, I think, yeah, to, to have, it, have it in mind here. This is kind of a local administration that at least early on is made up yeah, of, of native elites. It's... Uh, the, the head, usually that was the gobernador. Initially, initially, this would have been the uh, previous rulers yeah, of the state, although this changed over time. And uh, so now we have this, this uh, city council, yeah, and from there, the elites, uh, the, the, the nobility of Tlaxcala, for example, they could uh, come to Mexico City, Tenochtitlan, yeah, the, the colonial capital city um, and here they could for example bring their petitions for specific rights to the viceroy um, so viceroy this would be the representative of the of the spanish king overseas in in this region um, so and there's also there are other institutions like the um, royal courts or uh, royal audiencia uh, royal audiencia for example um, so this would be kind of on the re more regional level. There's also then this uh, more kind of international <laughs> level than uh, third one, which is uh, coming towards Spain, which I will uh, look at a bit today. So there's, this is then the other op another option actually for uh, native elites, also from here colonial Mexico, from uh, but from Peru as well. Yeah, this other major center of uh, for the. Um, Spaniards for the, from the Spanish Empire in in the in Spanish America um, and from different other regions as well to come towards uh, uh, Spain, yeah, the, the the Spanish court in in Madrid, um, and to bring petitions there to petition before the king um, in this kind of structure that the king was actually uh, was at the head of the state and would have been responsible for his. Uh, indigenous um, um, subjects. Subject. Thanks. <laughs> I had different languages. <laughs> um, so for his indigenous uh, subjects as well. Great. So um, and there's there's uh, some different precedents for that. Yeah, there's uh, what's uh, what's also called at the time a genre called uh, the relaciones de méritos. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. Tied to the to the merits, um, and uh, this goes really back uh, directly early on to the beginning of this Spanish invasions. Um, yeah, so for example, the Spanish uh, soldiers who came in and who then uh, who would um, have a military success and then demand specific uh, privileges over land or over um, tributes, uh, labor of indigenous people. Uh, and sent this this uh, uh, relaciones these writings to the Spanish crown. These were the early soldiers, and also then later on their descendants. Um, but yeah, as I just mentioned, there was a similar process, similar possibilities for um, for native people as well, uh, which is a bit of an interesting kind of difference from, for example. Um, uh, British America, yeah, or other forms of, of colonization 
taking place at that at that period. So yes, yeah, so we have these different kind of what we could call diplomatic missions. It's uh, sometimes it could be a larger group of nobles. Yeah, it, it could be maybe one or two really important um, uh, nobles only that came over, and they would present yeah different types of um, uh, of kind of um, yeah examples of different sources to back up their own claims. Um, so this could be uh, again uh, written in Spanish uh, chronicles. It could be these codices, these images as well, or later on paintings as well. And um, and here I would say that we have then different groups, at least now for from uh, from uh, thinking about Mexico as well. Yeah, we have uh, different groups that had specifically. Uh, quite uh, some success with these um, with 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 these <coughs> processes, um, and especially again with with the Nawa examples, yeah, because uh, Nawa there was this idea at least for the Spaniards towards the mid uh, towards the later six, 16th century that they already had quite some stronger control over these areas and mm. that they could actually uh, give maybe specific rights there or. Uh, to confirm specific rights, um, we also know yeah, that people, for example, from the, the Maya or people from the Yucatan and so on, who also did uh, send um, missions, but sometimes they had success, sometimes not. Yeah, this was still seen as maybe as more uh, dangerous, uh, dangerous um, regions. So, um, but for the Nawa, I would say a uh, different. Uh, groups had various successes, but uh, the Mexica definitely, as these previous rulers, yeah, they were recognized as such by the Spanish. Um, they did have quite some success here. Um, it was it kind of it fits yeah with the, with the Spanish ideas of or European ideas of royalty in some sense yeah that the the Mexica the rulers, uh, uh, for example, Moctezuma was the second to, to last. Uh, Pre-colonial ruler, yeah, that his descendants were really recognized. They did receive specific, uh, really quite large uh, um, territories and to rule over in, in Mexico, for example. Uh, yeah, two of his uh, of his daughters actually, yeah, who held these rights. So also uh, women who, in the specific uh, exceptional cases, who, who could hold onto um, important rights. Um, another case then he actually would be Tlaxcala, as I said, really quite successful, although we, we do have also other Nawa groups who could manage to um, sustain or to retain rights. And so I wanted to show you here now, it's one of the examples that uh, I mentioned various sources, various um, materials are being brought over. Um, and yeah. Okay. So this is um, this is a part of a part of a copy of the <laughs> Lienzo de Tlaxcala. Yeah, I, I should say it's, uh, uh, it's the original has been lost, um, unfortunately, uh, but it was commissioned probably around uh, 1552, and with the idea yeah, to send it over to to Spain in order to really to gain more rights or retain rights and um, and. This is the top part, yeah. The lower part, I, it would be a bit too much. Yeah, it's really this various, uh, many, many panels of, especially of warfare, yeah, of Tlaxcalteca who who aid the Spanish, who are, who are um, aiding in the warfare campaigns. Um, so I wanted to show you here just a, a bit on this uh, on this um, top part, which I think uh, tells us quite a lot about. Um, uh, yeah, the self perceptions of of Tlaxcalteca elites at that time. So um, I will just <laughs> describe a bit like this. Um, so we, uh, I, will, I will describe like this now. No problem. Um, yeah. So I will come a bit more to this to the central parts, but we we do have what I mentioned before, kind of this uh, separation to the four parts. Yeah, you can maybe see. Around the center, there are symbols. There are these two birds and two other symbols, which represent these four important parts of Tlaxcala. 
Um, and they are then surrounded yeah, by this, uh, various people who represent noble lineages, maybe we could say. And, um, well, so for example, the construction of, of a church yeah, on the left hand side, we have the construction also of a, of a cross at the bottom, yeah, highlighting this special kind of a religious fervor of, of Tlaxcala. So I, on the left-hand side now, I wanted to zoom in a little bit because this is, I think, at the center of this image is quite important part, um, where uh, at the top you have then the, the coat of arms. Yeah, we just <laughs> heard a bit about <laughs> coats of arms. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, we can uh, we include it at this at this point already. It's uh, from uh, Charles V, yeah, the Habsburg, uh, Spanish Emperor, Habsburg Emperor. And um, just below then, we have a symbol of Tlaxcala, which is, is a mountain, um, and also the actual coat of arms of Tlaxcala. It's, it's a bit of a simple version of it. So at the bottom here, um, below, uh, yeah, it's right at the bottom, and above this coat of arms, we have also it's kind of a smaller statue of a <coughs> virgin of the Assumption, yeah, so again, Christian symbol. Um, and then at the right hand side, there's also a bishop, bishop of uh, Mexico City, and uh, at the right hand side is, was the viceroy, yeah, so the highest uh, authority of, of this region, highest Spanish authority. So, um, this again, I think for me, it represents quite a bit about uh, this self perception, especially we have various symbols of Tlaxcala that are right below the, the Spanish uh, crown. Yeah, and this is, is actually really important. Yeah, this, this was um, true that there were rights given to Tlaxcala early on, kind of to saying that it was only answerable to the Spanish emperor, um, which was uh, quite quite special. Yeah, they did not. There was not any higher authority like the viceroys or other authorities. Um, they were again given also a coat of arms. Yeah, this was not uh, this was not very usual for the for a kind of an indigenous um, political entity. Um, they had the city um, that I mentioned before. It was kind of constructed on a European, um, following some Euro uh, the European city models. Um, and this also received kind of this title of the muy leal ciudad, yeah, this uh, very, um, um, yeah, very, uh, okay. <laughs> Lawyer, thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, today with the three, three languages today. Thanks. Uh, yeah, the very loyal city and kind of this title of the ciudad yeah, was was actually really important in the Spanish Empire, tied to specific rights, and uh, and mostly actually those were cities that had been founded by Spaniards. Yeah, so this is a bit of an exceptional case, and there were also then various other privileges given to Tlaxcala over time. Yeah, they had also tribute um, uh, exemptions. They had various tributes to give, again, directly to the Spanish crown, but other tributes were actually distributed by Tlaxcaltecan elites here. Yeah, so this is also, again, quite, uh, quite special. And uh, so also, yeah, I mean, I should mention here this, again, this was probably the Lienzo uh, tied to the to one mission in this mid 16th century. Also, I just brought here on the right hand side another image from the Lienzo, which again highlights this special religiosity. The leaders were uh, converting very early on, and uh, Cortes is sitting here on the right hand side. Then uh, it's kind of presiding yeah, over <laughs> over this, um, probably with his indigenous um, translator Malintzin, who's who's standing behind. Uh, who is a really very important figure as well. Um, so yeah, mid, six, mid 16th century, but we have various other missions really even before yeah, the first one uh, that took place, I think in 1528 already, a few uh, nobles who would come back with Cortes from one of his campaigns to Spain and already managed to secure rights. Um, so we have uh, quite a few others then, over the spanning of the 16th century, um, and also even yeah, throughout the colonial era, when it was maybe important to secure more more influence, more more rights. Um, 
another one that I, or another example of this I just uh, wanted to mention as well here is, uh, would be in the 1580s. There's another there's, uh, quite an important uh, well-known author from Tlaxcala was, uh, was uh, Diego Munoz Camargo, yeah, who actually wrote in, in Spanish. He brought then his own this book, a larger book, brought uh, himself to Spain to bring to the king. And he probably, uh, yeah, he also definitely had some copies from images from this Lienzo de Tlaxcala as well. Um, and so, and Munoz Camargo himself also is, is quite one of these uh, quite interesting figures, yeah, important uh, Nawa scholar, and but who was actually himself, he was descended from this kind of, um, uh, from Span like his father would have been a Spanish soldier, yeah, who, who married uh, a noble woman from, from Tlaxcala. Um, he himself also, again, then married with uh, another uh, woman of, uh, of high standing from Tlaxcala to kind of, uh, which was quite, yeah, kind of a common uh, tactic, maybe we can say in some way, or common thing that uh, happened with this elite families. Um, of course, also early on, this this was tied to forced uh, marriages between Spaniards and native uh, women. Um, and so with um, Munoz Camargo, then he also um, he also brings in or expands on some of these narratives around this uh, kind of exceptionalism of, of Tlaxcala. Um, so um, exceptional in some ways, and he, he talks about it as, uh, yeah, he highlights um, the, yeah, this, the special Christianity, that some examples that I showed you about here before he, uh, again, highlights the special uh, relationship to the Spaniards in the conquest uh, wars, and uh, again, yeah, one of one of these uh, successful cases then in the in the fifteen eighties. So from here, I will mention just a bit now. I think because I've been coming uh, talking a bit more about this transatlantic context. Uh, just uh, talked to you about this this one uh, case study now. Um, but I should mention maybe here at this, at this topic um, that this is also, and I think it's quite an important discussion here yeah, about kind of the role of um, native people from, from the Americas, uh, kind of their more global uh, transatlantic influence. Um, this is, the, yeah, there have been various studies now, yeah, especially the, the last few years now, uh, for example, uh, by uh, Nancy van Doysen or by Carolyn Pannock now uh, quite, <laughs> quite recently as well. Um, and they really highlight here yeah, that this, uh, this, these are really important stories to tell and also, again, to say that kind of from a European <coughs> perspective, yeah, that this, um, this influence, this agent, agency of uh, na people, native people from the Americas in Europe that has uh, still not really been told, yeah, that is uh, maybe there's definitely research on it, but it's still popularly not so well known. Um, and yeah, compared to other, for example, the stories of uh, people of African descent in Europe that are becoming more known now. Um, yeah, so this is, I think, this is quite a, quite an important larger story. It ties in with the, uh, this influence via diplomacy, trade, uh, the history writing that I mentioned crossing uh, across the Atlantic, um, but also then uh, tied to to native uh, enslavement, yeah, there's uh, enslavery, um, which really did take place over a larger time frame of uh, mm -hmm. uh, native uh, people were being sent over to Spain, for example, yeah, thousands of, of people um, into the 16th and 17th centuries who, who um, were sent forcibly to Spain to, to, to work there. So, yeah, kind of this a bit uh, uh, coming a bit towards this larger picture here. Um, and also then I wanted to, for kind of the final <laughs> part now here from my, from my talk, um, I wanted to move a bit back and uh, back again towards uh, Mexico. I, I tried to come, um, come a bit more to, towards Europe before. Um, and this is also maybe to, to uh, mention uh, just a few uh, 
words also kind of on, on the context uh, the Me Mexican context uh, for for the influence of Tlaxcala. Um, so because I think it's uh, the, I wanted to, or I should add here yeah, that uh, kind of the story with Tlaxcala with using was using these various narratives where who did have quite some success. Uh, yeah, it could could seem like a kind of this uh, quite a success a story of success. Yeah, positive story. Um, of, of these elites, um, but I think we, we also always do have to keep in mind yeah, the 16th century, this is really this time of the massive upheavals uh, taking place, of course, all across the Americas, uh, what, um, what has been termed as a genocide or as a demographic catastrophe. Um, and yeah, which is, uh, as uh, many of you know, of course, here, yeah, but this is kind of the effects of the, this, uh, military wars, the, um, forms of slavery, forced labor. There were also campaigns of forced resettlements, for example, in, uh, Mexico and many other regions. Um, and these would then combine and would actually, um, would, um, kind of strengthen the impact of the, Epidemics that also uh, had not been known before in, in the Americas would kind of amplify the impact. And so this means also, yeah, kind of as, uh, again, as this background here that actually, for example, someone like Munoz Camargo, whom I mentioned, was writing in the 1580s his works. And at this time also, he describes yeah, the really massive uh, death, uh, massive impact of these epidemics and other diseases um so it the disease and these other factors could lead to a mortality of up to 90 percent yeah depending on which region until the early 17th century in, in spanish america so kind of this massive demographic catastrophe maybe we could we want to call it this way which is one background um another background as well that i wanted to just mention here is I've been talking about some of the these uh, Tlaxcalteca elites, these nobles uh, who did weird different forms of uh, political power. Um, but then, I mean, I was more in the 16th century, but also towards the 17th century, they, these different authors, they would kind of decry the loss of their political power in different mm -hmm. stages. Um, yeah, the, some authors, uh, for example, um, Juan Zapata y Mendoza is the author of the, late, of the 17th century. He's saying really uh, how now in his time there are people from outside who are being sent by the Spanish to, to kind of take part in this in the city council. Um, there are also people of mixed descent or maybe even people kind of commoners yeah, who are not part of the elite who can gain more um, political power now. So this is also, I think, one one aspect here, kind of this political upheavals that affect the native elites. So what I've been talking about now and I uh, wanted to conclude here at this point um, is kind of the various, these various forms of Tlaxcalteca exceptionalism, spe special religiosity. I can say, see it here also with the really early conversion that's highlighted here, this kind of this construction of different narratives in the colonial era that builds on earlier um, precedents of, of history writing. And this also then, as I, I've been mentioning it, draws on different strategies also on a transatlantic uh, context. And all of this then actually then again takes place before these uh, different factors of demographic and political decline and <coughs> upheavals. And uh, because uh, since I've started out with a poem, I just mm -hmm. <laughs> wanted to show you this to kind of to end on a, another poem here, which I hope uh, shows kind of uh, brings back some of the themes that uh, I've been discussing today. Um, this is uh, again by a, uh, this time by a Tlaxcalteca author, scholar from the um, writing in the mid uh, 18th century, and he's actually uh, comes again from the from this higher elites. His family was also in the city council called uh, 
Miguel Sanchez de Salazar from an important family. Um, and he in the 18th century wrote kind of four poems to these four rulers who had sided with the, with the Spanish. Um, and one of them here that I wanted to show you is about the very loyal and Christian king Don Bartolomé Zitlal Popoca. And so he addresses him here yeah, in this kind of Baroque style. So he's saying, how can I eulogize you, O invincible Bartolomé, when during the conquest your valor surpassed that of Mars, if any comparison could be made? Such things will never be repeated, I argue for no small reason, because with your undying love you gave to Carlos V mm -hmm. all that amounts to a new world. Mm -hmm. Thank you.